Excellent. So good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming along um, to this evening's uh, webinar. My name is Nikki Oxall, and I'm the research coordinator at the PFLA. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome um, our speakers this evening to talk to you about agroforestry. And hopefully we're going to get into some quite practical, nitty gritty parts of um, planning agroforestry systems, um, but also the benefits of uh, silver pasture. So um, before we get started, uh, just a few um, just a few housekeeping things. So as I said, we are recording this session. If you could all make sure you're on mute, we're not doing this through the normal webinar um, approach. We're doing using this as a kind of Zoom room just to try and encourage um, the opportunity for pe people to ask questions as we go through the session. Um, so that does mean that I'm going to ask you to all make sure you're muted. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Catherine Owen, who is Demonstration Engagement Manager, and Helen Cheshire, who's Lead Farming Advocate, both from the Woodland Trust, for their support in getting this uh, session happening this evening. Um, so, yeah, just a quick thank you to both of them who I know are in, in the call this evening. Um, so quick introduction then, and um, we have, um, I'm really, really happy to say that we have Lindsay Wistance joining us, who is Senior Livestock Researcher at the Organic Research Centre. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Lindsay already, and if you have a copy of this wonderful publication, um, you'll have probably seen some of her work that is published in there. Um, and if you don't have a copy of this, uh, which is the Agroforestry Handbook, you can download it for free from the Soil Association uh, website. Uh, and there's links to it as well on the Organic uh, Research Centre website. So uh, Lindsay has been um, working primarily on um, livestock health and welfare, um, particularly I think her PhD was in uh, eliminating uh, eliminative behaviour of dairy cows and potential for adjustment to improve welfare, which sounds very uh, impressive. Um, and then ongoing research for the last 18 years or so. So um, we're, we're really delighted that Lindsay's been able to come and talk to us this evening. We're also going to be joined by uh, Luke Dale Harris, who is Farm Conservation Advisor with FWAG Southwest. Um, he's based in Devon and his work covers sustainable grazing strategies, agroforestry and developing assured environmental supply chains. And and he's also a director of Farm Wilder, um, which is a wildlife friendly beef and lamb marketing scheme. Uh, so I'm really, I'm really, really pleased that we've been able to get Luke to come and speak this evening. And we have Mick Bracken, who is the Woodland Trust Outreach Manager in the Southwest, uh, working with private woodland owners to manage and create woodland. Uh, in, he's been working as a contractor, consultant with private forestry sector, and more recently with the Forestry Commission and various woodland initiatives. Um, and his background is in botany and sustainable agriculture, and he's ex interested and excited to combine these um, in North Devon silver arable trials. And I've just realised that we've got folk from the very southwest, and I'm in the very northeast in Aberdeenshire. So we're, we're truly representing a cross UK um, picture this evening. So um, I'm going to stop waffling on now and hand over to Lindsay, who I think is going to share her screen um, and look forward to hearing your presentation, Lindsay. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Let me just. Hopefully, has that worked? Can people see my screen? Yeah, I can see that. Excellent. Oh. Right. Let's make this work. Right. Uh, yes. Thanks, Nikki. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the benefits, the multiple benefits that uh, trees bring to our livestock. So in silver pasture, animals show less aggression and less fear towards herd mates than when they're on open pasture. In cattle, the social behaviour is both more cohesive and more positive. They stay closer together and the positive behaviour of social licking constitutes 78% of all social interactions which is almost twice that of cows on open pasture. And there is also some evidence that they are less fearful of human beings, and this is at least partly attributed to them having something physical to hide behind. A healthy coat and a healthy skin is an important frontline defence against disease, and all animals spend part of every day in managing this through licking, preening, and rubbing. Through rubbing, they can remove dead skin and hair and seeds that can penetrate the skin, as well as dislodging external parasites such as ticks. 
Now, access to trees and shrubs at a variety of angles enables them to access most body parts. At malting time, access to rubbing posts becomes even more important when the removal of dead hair, fleece and skin can also help with temperature regulation. Now, I include an image of poultry here. And although poultry don't use solid objects for body maintenance other than dust bathing, they do show more preening behaviour under the shelter of a tree canopy when compared to on open pasture. Now the buffering effect of trees for animals also applies to the environment, which in turn increases both the comfort and the resources available to the livestock. Through shade and changes in evaporation and transpiration rates, the trees can help keep the grass green under drought conditions. And this is an image from the summer uh, of 2018, up in the top left-hand corner. Through increased water infiltration, this established ash silvopasture system in the top right-hand corner has extended the grazing system by a full 17 weeks, with five weeks in the spring and the remaining 12 weeks at the end of the grazing season. A shelter can also help protect against the cold since in winter, minimum surface temperatures can be raised by as much as six degrees centigrade, providing easier grazing conditions and a warmer place to lie down for outwintered animals. Considering shelter from cold conditions, trees can offer good protection from rain, wind and cold. Now, animals have both a higher and a lower critical temperature, outside of which there are increasing risks to health and welfare. They cannot access sufficient shelter, they begin to mobilise energy to maintain core body temperature. For beef cattle, the general rule of thumb is that for every one degree drop below their lower critical temperature, there is a 2% increase in energy requirements. Now, for cattle that have developed a normal winter coat, which is dry, the lower critical temperature is around zero degrees. Now, if we then consider the negative effects of a cold wind and take an example of an air temperature of plus two degrees with a wind speed of 16 miles an hour, the effective temperature now becomes minus seven degrees, thus requiring an increase of 14% more feed. But if these animals are also wet, their lower critical temperature shoots up from a zero degree centigrade to 15 and a half degrees. So in this particular scenario, these cattle would now require 45% extra feed just to break even. Healthy sheep with a full fleece are better able to withstand adverse weather conditions compared to cattle. But in 2013, with both the Beast from the East and Storm Emma, over 150,000 sheep died in Wales alone. In contrast, in the summer, for newly shorn sheep, the lower critical temperature is extremely high at 28 degrees centigrade. Now, with a mean day temperature of 16 degrees, which is typical for May when we start to shear sheep in the UK, the required extra feed would be 20%, again, with further substantial increases with wind and rain. Now, although fleece grows quickly, the changing climate is bringing more changeable weather patterns so that adverse weather conditions like this become more likely. Juvenile animals typically have limited body reserves to compensate for cold stress. And when they're born outside, their little wet bodies can lose heat very quickly. Now for lambs, this heat loss can be as much as 10 degrees in the first 30 minutes of life. And combined with starvation, exposure causes about 30% of all lamb deaths. Now it's worth noting that ewes have very different needs to the lambs. And if they have to travel too far to find food and water, they will leave the sheltered areas, taking the lambs with them. And so the close positioning of feed and water sources, as well as providing sufficient shelter to avoid overcrowding and mismothering, 
will encourage the ewes to remain at the sheltered birth site for longer. And this then also helps to strengthen the ewe lamb bonds and lamb survival to weaning. So we know that the establishment of visual and vocal recognition in both the ewes and the lambs takes around one day for singles and three days for multiples. So encouraging them to stay in that sheltered place for that length of time is uh, quite important. <clears throat> now, unsurprisingly, all young stock with shelter are expending less energy on maintaining body temperatures and so have higher growth rates than those without shelter. And for lambs, the increase in growth rates has been measured at around 21%. So this is an example of an existing sheep system where trees are key to its success. It's a farm near the Cairngorms in Scotland, where the belt of commercial evergreen trees at the top now act as a living barn at lambing time. This shelter has increased both lamb survival and has cut the feed bills for the ewes. And the trees in the bottom half of the image offer shelter for the pasture so that there is earlier and more grass available for the lactating ewes, as well as further shelter for the growing lambs. And the utilization of trees in this system has enabled the farmer to change his breed from Scottish black faces to clean with a Texel tup. And so he can produce a more commercially viable lamb with fewer inputs and with higher animal welfare. Now as important as shade is, sorry, shelter is, Shade is globally the single most important benefit that trees provide for animals. Now heat stress happens when an animal's heat load is greater than its capacity to lose that heat. <clears throat> and when they begin to experience heat stress, they seek shade. For cattle, this begins at around 18 degrees centigrade, depending on things such as coat color and production status. Now, of course, animals can recover from milder heat stress uh, during the cooler period, such as at nighttime. But it's worth remembering that there is still a reduction in feed intake during the hotter periods. And milk yields of dairy cows can be reduced by up to three litres a day, along with the reduction of protein and fat content of the milk. With more serious heat stress, Blood is redirected from all non-vital systems and out to the skin where it can be cooled. Now, these non-vital systems include the reproductive tract so that conception, as well as embryonic development and growth are all compromised. It also includes the gut, where up to 50% of the blood servicing the gut is redirected towards body cooling. And the consequence of this is a more permeable gut membrane which can no longer prevent endotoxins and mycotoxins ending up in the bloodstream, which then triggers an inflammation cascade. Research in Italy has shown that dairy cows without shade have significantly higher levels of mastitis than those with access to shade. They've also shown that cows who suffer heat stress in late gestation have lower immunoglobulin G levels in their colostrum resulting in smaller heifer calves who go on to produce less milk in their first two lactations compared to animals that were offered shade. And so with higher disease levels, compromised production through slower growth rates, lower yields and poorer reproduction rates, the annual costs of heat stress to the American dairy industry has been calculated at over $900 million. For their beef industry, it's been calculated at over $400 million. Huge, huge loss based on poor welfare. In contrast, in well-designed silver pasture systems, solar radiation can be reduced by 58% compared to open pasture. And the skin temperature of cattle has been measured at four degrees lower. Now, under these more benign conditions, Animals maintain their normal behavior patterns, including feeding behavior. And a study in Texas showed that cattle in, with shade reached their target body weight 20 days earlier than those without shade. 
So animals in silvery pasture systems also utilize that landscape and its resources more evenly. And the further benefit of this is the more even spread of recycled nutrients, including nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And it's worth noting here that overall, silver pasture produces more forage per unit area than pasture alone. Well, all livestock species browse, both trees and shrubs, and those familiar with cattle will have observed that the first thing they do when they enter a new field is to check out the browsing. On an annual basis, the average intake of browse is 12% of total diet for cattle, for sheep it's 20%, and for goats it's 60%. At times, however, the amount of browse in the diet can increase substantially under different seasons or weather conditions when the grasses and forks don't thrive or grow, or when the attractiveness of young tree shoots is high. And during these times, Intake of browse can increase substantially to a higher percentage of diet. And for cattle, this is 55%, sheep, 76%, and goats, it's as high as 93%. Now, the Woodland Grazing Toolbox has developed this palatability scale for trees that are typically present in the Scottish landscape. They do note that holly and hawthorn are positioned at a uh, ranked four and five, but they themselves discuss whether these are the correct places for them or whether they should indeed be higher on the list. I want to take this um, moment to talk a little bit about palatability because it's not just simply defined by the sense, um, by the taste of something. Palatability is really quite a sophisticated interrelationship between the senses, which is primarily taste, as well as mechanical and chemical feedback from post-ingestion processes. And this post-ingestive feedback effectively calibrates the hedonist sensations and regulates whether something is eaten and in what amounts. In Mediterranean conditions, lambs are often growing at a time of year when there is little green grass available so that sources of vitamin E are low which increases the risk of white muscle disease. There are, however, lots of shrubs with green leaves, but these leaves are high in tannins and so low in palatability. So in a trial that was conducted with lambs deficient in vitamin E, they were offered an unpalatable source of feed that was very high in vitamin E. And this they switched to until the balance was regained and then they immediately move back to the more palatable feed. Now, in this study, the lamb's internal feedback was sufficiently sensitive for them to seek out this novel behaviour with the required nutrients before any clinical symptoms emerged or could be measured. And the authors of this study suggested that the initiation of behaviour was almost um, coming from a cellular level rather than a learned behaviour. So this table presents the nutritional content of leaves compared to grass and clover grown in the same environment. Now, as you can see, they compare very well with all of them having higher fat content and grey alder and aspen having slightly lower sugar than the meadow hay and rowan having lower protein than the clover. Other than that, they all outperform the meadow hay and the red clover. In the UK, traditional tree fodder trees are ash, elm and holly, but most tree species are browsable. Although we must note here, there um, should be considerations about quantity, time of year and condition of the trees. For example, we know that when wild cherry is wilted, cyanide levels increase dramatically. And I want to make a point about the list on this slide here, because although they are were all used as fodder trees in Sweden, they do not reflect the choices of the animal, but more the species available to the farmer uh, in this Swedish farming landscape. 
So the farmers would feed the least palatable, which is the older first, at the beginning of winter and keep the more palatable, i.e. the ash, for feeding prior to the next grazing system uh, season. <clears throat> now, sourcing good protein for animal feed is a global issue. And here is a more up-to-date study looking at the protein content, again, of just tree leaves. Now, crude and degradable protein in tree leaves, particularly in ash, lime and mulberry, compare very well with levels found in the alfalfa and the ryegrass. And mulberry is an outstanding protein source. But in contrast to the grasses, leaves also contain, contain condensed tannins. Now, although condensed tannins inhibit normal digestion of protein in the rumen, the bonds that prevent these proteins being broken down are themselves broken down in the more acidic abomasum, effectively delivering a good quality rumen bypass protein to the small intestine. And currently, condensed tannins up to 5% of dry matter intake is considered beneficial. Another benefit of feeding condensed tannins is the reduction of methane. So we know that the methane produced off willow is less than half of that from alfalfa. So not only do trees compare very well in terms of uh, major macro uh, nutrients, they are also a very good source of micronutrients and particularly minerals. And here are some results uh, from uh, an organic research centre study that was um, four or five years ago. Zinc, for example, is very high in osier willow, or Salix viminalis, and it plays an important role in skin integrity, as well as promoting the efficient metabolism of protein and carbohydrates. Goat willow is a good source of calcium and phosphorus in a handy two to one ratio. That's Salix capria. And some later research that we've carried out with um, some other uh, colleagues um, has shown it to be a good source of cobalt for growing lambs. Now, uh, in the top left hand corner in the red box, you can see that alder is uh, a good source of some nutrients, uh, but is largely unattractive as a feed source. However, the high level of nitrogen content uh, indicates its superior nitrogen fixing qualities. The ability of animals to self-regulate intake is often discussed and there is an increasing body of evidence that supports animals being able to balance nutrient intake over a full day rather than at each meal. And there is also increasing evidence that the animals are capable of self-medicating. So in the bottom left hand corner, we have an image of a cow uh, taking in bicarbonate of soda. Now, this is an image from a farm, an organic farm in Wisconsin, where the farmer offers um, bicarbonate of soda ad lib to his dairy cows. Now, bicarbonate of soda acts as a pH buffer and intake of this increases dramatically in the autumn as the cows are transitioning from grass to the more acidic silage. In the top left hand corner, we have a rather grotesque image of a steer with half a rabbit in its mouth, uh, or half out of its mouth. Now, uh, cattle kept on moorland, such as this steer, are kept on a phosphorus poor environment and without sufficient mineral supplementation, they will seek out other sources of that mineral, including the bones of dead animals. And perhaps here, a few goat willow shrubs might have been a kinder solution. In the top right hand corner, uh, we have willow, which is a very high uh, source of salicylic acid. We know that salicylic acid is well known as a painkiller but it's worth noting that it has antibiotic, antipyretic, anti-inflammatory and fungicidal properties. In one study, when ewes were offered two different varieties of willow to browse on, 
they selected the one that was highest in salicylic acid. We don't know why they chose to do this, but it does demonstrate that they could tell the difference. If we again consider the benefit of condensed tannins, well, they also help to control internal parasite burdens, both by reducing the number of parasites reaching maturity and by reducing the size of those uh, larvae that reach maturity so that fewer eggs are produced the following generation. And also studies here have shown that sheep and goats with high worm burdens switch to eating plants with high levels of condensed tannins and can reduce their burden by 50% in this way. So if we consider how we might incorporate trees into the uh, animal's world as a feed source, well then let us look at direct browsing first. For this, of course, we need to know browse heights. Uh, and for cattle, it's around two meters without the electric fence. Uh, for sheep, it's around 1.2 meters. Uh, and for goats, it's non-existent because of, because of their physical agility, they're termed vertical browsers. There are other management possibilities, of course. We can cut and drop fresh as um, many farmers now in New Zealand are doing during their dry summers. This particular image is of a long established soil pasture system in Berkshire where wood is harvested for heating uh, but it's cut and dropped fresh so that the sheep can browse it clean first. In the top right hand corner we have cut and carried still fed fresh and this is typical for small holdings smaller groups of animals that are kept closer to farms. And then finally, we have uh, preserved as tree fodder, either as tree hay or in siled. Uh, and here, this is an image of tree hay that's been prepared for dairy goats. Now, I'm not going to dwell on the negative aspects of um, getting it wrong, if you like, but of course, there are some, as with any uh, farming system. So we have to consider um, the protection, the mechanical protection of trees to stop prevent, uh, to stop animals browsing. So we've got a, a um, Guernsey cow here that has been stabbed with a blackthorn and now has an infected wound. We have to consider overuse. So we've got poaching, we've got loss of vegetation. Where there's too little shade, we've got overcrowding of animals, increasing the risk also of disease within the animals, and we've also uh, got more flies. However, there are ways around this. In very well-designed silvopasture systems, we not only increase the number of insects, but we also bring in the predators. And some research has shown that in the well-designed silver pasture systems, when you, when you take a head count of flies, there are actually 40% fewer flies than on open pasture. And we can also utilize the properties of trees themselves. So we know that pine trees, for example, have uh, intersecticidal properties. And there is some anecdotal evidence that elder and walnut and perhaps lime also have insecticidal properties. And so putting trees into an animal's environment brings diversity, offering animals valid choices to maintain better social conditions, better body health, nutritional health, as well as comfort. And all of these things fulfill the ideals of good animal welfare. Assuming that they have appropriate genetics for these systems, these conditions also then enable these animals to fulfill their genetic potential so that yield and product quality is also optimised. Thank you. Lindsay, thank you so much. That was um, 
absolutely brilliant really fascinating um and great to see that there is just so much scientific um research that is is underpinning a lot of this knowledge um and and so much that maybe people are observing but it's great to know that it that it is underpinned and we haven't had any questions come through the chat but in case anyone does have a question if they could pop it into the chat that would be great meanwhile i have a question um i'd be interested i'm really interested in palatability um we implement agroforestry here and we're seeing very seasonal shifts through the year um, as to when our cattle are munching on various different um, trees. And so just really interested in whether you know it's if it's to do more with vitamin um, and mineral availability or whether it's to do with, you know, that taste factor that changes through the year. Yeah, I mean, it's a really complicated um, question to answer. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, the things that I've been saying here are really generic things, but um, it can change from place to place. So you have to consider soil type um, and what the soil is providing to the trees. You have to consider the conditions of the animals. Um, and sometimes they are also trade-offs. So for example, we know that the higher condensed, the plants with higher condensed tannins are also more bitter, but if they, need it for a particular reason then palatability is or the tastiness of it is balanced with other needs so it's really hard to just say black and white this is why they do what they do <laughs> so, and there can be multiple reasons so of course you know it can be tasty yes you know cattle all animals just like humans are attracted to to tastiness and and can certainly overfeed on some things um That's great, Lindsay. Sorry, I'm just just because of time, I'm going to just move on to another question. There's a question about planting density, but I think that maybe Mick um, and Luke will be able to help answer that one. So that will probably come up in the next part of the presentation. So, Sarah, thanks for asking that, but we'll come back to it. Um, yeah, John can... had a question. Oh, sorry, go on. Well, only that um, planting density can also be considered in terms of browsing, because, of course, you have to consider recovery rates. So um, if you've got a highly attractive um, plant there and you've got heavy overbrowsing, then you risk that tree dying. Um, the recommendation, the general recommendation, is that you don't allow overbrowsing, so 50% browsing maximum, and then time for that tree to recover. So it, it's also worth considering on those levels. Excellent. And a couple of quick questions. One, um, do different breeds of cattle have different critical temperatures? Uh, yes, they do. Um, uh, it depends what, what conditions they're bred for. It's partly genetic. So for example, if you've got, uh, I've just been reading a discussion about horns. So for example, if you've got um, an Ancoli um, cow with huge horns, those horns are very, very important for her um, temperature regulation. And, and enables the body to maintain temperatures better. Um, however, if you put her in a Scottish condition, then she would not be able to maintain cold, um, her body temperature because she can't stop that happening. Um, at the same time, if you put a, if you put a fat Aberdeen Angus <laughs> into desert conditions, um, she would also not be able to cope. So yes, there are, and, but of course, you know, it's production level as well. High yielding dairy cows are producing vast amounts of heat, um, you know, as our black skinned or black coated animals are producing more heat to lighter skinned animals, lighter coated animals. Brilliant. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, there are some other questions, but I'm really aware that we've got quite a lot to get through. So what I think we'll do is we'll hand over to Mick and Luke. Um, I will collect the questions. Um, I know, Lindsay, you're going to have to dip out probably before we finish um but i um maybe i can answer some of these and maybe what we can do is then send some round to email for folk who have been um who have asked questions you know if we're not able to answer them so um mick if you want to go ahead and make a start that would be great and i'll yeah, my sharing now can you see that yeah we can see that thank you okay, i'm just going to go to full screen there um one thing you might be 
worth mentioning in answer to a couple of questions I saw coming up there um, from a silver cultural point of view in terms of tree density um, is, and there's a point that we haven't actually put in this presentation, so it's worth making now before I forget, is that um, it, it's a silver cultural question. So you can plant quite sparsely, as we will, in, in, uh, as we'll demonstrate here, and you might have to manage the trees a little bit more, um, more closely to establish, or you can plant densely and um, you have a little bit more choice and you have a little bit more freedom in that. But the important thing to consider is all the, the density will have an effect on light and obviously production of grass production. So the thing to remember is that, and I think it's often forgotten, is that you can always thin. So trees are always growing, but trees can always be managed thinned coppice to maintain optimum light conditions. So where your starting point isn't, it is quite important and we cover that in this trial, but um, um, in this um, presentation, but actually I think it's quite important to remember that once you've reached a certain stage that can be modified from whatever you need. So uh, we were asked to put together um, a bit of a demonstration of a case study. And um, we were lucky enough to have uh, eight because um, we're, with our partners, you can see listed on the bottom of this slide, putting together a trial, very important trial, we think, to, to look at all the various considerations that might affect silver pasture. Um, so just sort of, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pass through that. We've, we've basically got eight farms um, running in this trial. And as our, um, as our example, we've chosen a farmer who's decided to go for, oh, I beg your pardon, I skipped a bit there. So we, we were charged with putting together some designs to help the farmers uh, choose what might be appropriate to their farms. We put together three basic models, which we will run through. And the farm we've chosen actually went for uh, all three of those, um, those models. So uh, we're gonna run through those one by one during the, uh, during the course of this presentation. And we, it gives us an opportunity to explain to you some of the trials and tribulations we had in, in, in putting those, in actually practically delivering those models. And I expect, I suspect that's, that's actually uppermost on all your minds as well, what you have to go through if you're going to put something like this together. So I'm, I promise you, we haven't got all the answers, but we can at least talk you through some of the problems that we had and the way that we, um, we thought we might uh, overcome them. And bear in mind all the time that this is a trial. There's an awful lot to find out with this. So we haven't got all the answers, but we might be able to sort of cover a few um, important points. So um, as a general housekeeping thing, as we, as we progress through, we thought, I think it might not work this way, but we thought the best thing to do was to leave a little bit of a gap after presenting each specific model that we went through that you might be able to, um, uh, we, we, that we could potentially answer some questions on. And I've got Luke. Luke will be able to answer the, um, uh, the more farming related uh, 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 questions to do with uh, grass production, um, soil, etc. I hopefully will be able to answer the more um, silvicultural uh, parts. And uh, Lindsay's very kindly agreed to chip in on the animal behavior nutrition side of things if, if questions like that come up. So uh, we're hoping to open it up between each model that we present uh, for a short while. And then we're, at the end, I think we just open it up and have a general sort of question, um, question and answer session between the three of us. So I'll just pass you over to Luke now to talk through the, uh, the farm that we're using as a model, which is West Emblet Farm at Black Dog. Um, hi, everybody. Um, before I do that, I'm going to give you a bit of background about the silver pasture trial because I think it's important to get a little context. Um, so it's the idea of it was that there is a lot of information and research that already exists around silver pasture, um, a lot of which Lindsay already touched on, but much of it is is not specific to the UK, and so much of it has to be relevant to different countries, um, especially I especially when it comes to productivity questions and around the sport of productivity. Um, so we decided that we needed to do a 
comprehensive trial and bringing as many partners as we possibly could. Um, and it had to be farmer led um, so that the farmers could dictate what the research would prioritize um, and we could build it around their systems. Um, so it ended up all being situated in, in North Devon in between the moors, between Exmoor and Dartmoor. Um, and we've got, as Mick said, we've got eight farmers. And they're a pretty diverse, well, reasonably diverse bunch. They're 50% organic, 50% conventional, mix of dairy, beef, and sheep. Um, and they've all got different reasons for introducing trees into their farms. So the first thing we did was to, to get an idea of what those priorities were, what challenges they wanted to address by introducing um, and the priorities were split into two groups, into environmental, um, and that's diffuse environmental, so that, uh, environmental that isn't necessarily directly relevant to the farm itself, and environmental considerations that will be more, you know, have more effect with their farm business. Um, so they're split into carbon sequestration, um, hydrology, meaning in this case, both drainage and water retention. Um, biodiversity, meaning above ground biodiversity, so birds, bats, moths, that kind of thing, as well as pests and their predators, as Lindsay referred to earlier. Um, and then mycorrhizal associations. Um, and animal behavior touched on many of the things that Lindsay already talked about, so shade, shelter, um, nutrition through browse, um, and the ability of trees to mobilize minerals and trace elements and throughout the soil profile. Um, and then natural medication and natural medics. And finally, conserving of leaf bodies, hay or silage for the winter. Um, so it was quite interesting to see the results come back because the environmental ones were grouped pretty evenly. Um, so we, we saw that people valued the carbon cycle sequestration, biodiversity and hydrology all exactly equally across the group. And then my riser fell below that, which was fine with us. <laughs> we didn't really have an idea of how we were going to stand with it, um, but it seemed to be quite effective. So that's on the back burner for now. Um, and then animal behaviour, shelter from wind and rain and shade was the top priority of all the farms in the group, followed by nutrition and medication. Um, and then conserving leaf fodder came out at the bottom. People want an easy life, I guess. Um, so we, we use that as a basis uh, to design the research protocols upon. Um, and Rotham said research um, have taken on the below ground environmental metrics. And Lindsay, an organic research centre, will be focusing on many of the um, animal behavioural and it's a long trial. I mean, a lot of that doesn't kick off until five, ten years down the line. Um, so we're going to be here for a while. Um, on top of all of that, we're collecting data on practical considerations around establishment. So things like tree protection, um, particularly tree protection against rubbing animals, um, and then the efficacy of electric fencing against stock netting. Um, using sheep for short-term grazing through, um, through the establishment period so that they can keep the sward in some productive condition but without knocking the trees. Um, so that's, that's probably the first bit of research that will come out and probably the most important in a practical sense. Um, so Lindsay and, and Flag are leading on that and the things. Um, and Mick referred to the fact that we have three designs um, and they we had a we had a situation where because there are a number of farms involved we need consistency of planting design from farm to farm and specifically um, consistency around planting density um, especially when it comes to doing the below ground um, so the soil sampling metrics we we need to have comparable data from farm to farm so we settled on a set number of trees, which would be 200 trees per farm, uh, per hectare, um, split evenly between shrubs and standard trees. And we'll go to what those species are in a bit. Um, and then on top of that, we're using 
an additional three, three hawthorn, in some cases blackthorn, um, per standard tree as a means of protection. So they're being planted around the base of each tree, um, not shrubs, just standard trees, the oaks and the alders and aspens and field maples. Um, and the idea of that is they will act as protection. They'll mimic natural processes to an extent and, and prevent animals rubbing against the trees at the point when a tree has grown above browse height but is still too spindly to resist withstand grazing. Um, so that's the basis for the designs. Um, and we'll go through the designs in a lot more detail as we go along. Um, so back to this farm, to West Emlick Farm, which is a black dog, um, which is a tiny little hamlet um, in an area of Devon where there's not much but tiny little hamlets. Um, and Hen Curtis is She's an organic farmer who, um, who runs 250 acres, um, mixed, but with the arable crop used as fodder for the livestock. Um, she, she runs a beef circular herd, um, which has 30 cows in their, in their followers, so probably 60 livestock in this overall. Um, and then 200 views, and she keeps the land through to finish. Um, <clears throat> the land's on, it's on the edge of the Redlands, which is, is the bit of Devon that's got the, the most productive farming area of Devon and it's where all the dairy or a lot of the dairy congregated and it's been pretty well destroyed over the last 70 years or so um, and Hen is in a in a valley um, where it's it's somehow well like many valleys it's resisted the intensification of the surrounding landscape I've just seen a comment that says you can't hear what I'm saying, which is bad news. I'm sorry about that. I'll sit closer and talk louder. Um, I hope you haven't missed everything. Um, and so the um, so she's her farm is in a valley on the edge of the Devon Redlands, um, and the valley is more extensively managed than the surrounding area, which is much more intensive. And the soil is relatively good, but not as good as our neighbours. It's, it's, it's red, loam, relatively free draining. That's better, says Nikki. Um, so it's relatively free draining, but heavy in places, and some of it lies wet. Um, she has mostly permanent pasture and then, and then fields which are in organic rotation with herbal lay, increasingly with herbal lays, but still a lot of um, more traditional grass lays. And she runs a relatively loose grazing rotation um, on kind of eight to 15 uh, acre paddocks. Um, I've just been asked if there are any slides with the presentation. There are, but this is me babbling on over one slide. So we'll move on. Um, so she's, she runs a loose grazing rotation, but is planning to, to manage it slightly more thoroughly. So she's, she's looking to introduce an element of mob grazing into her design, which underpins what we look to do with the silver cross design. Um, over to Nick. Right. So, I'm just gonna say, very trundle through this quite quickly. This is just Woodland Trust interest in this scheme is, is about connectivity of habitat. We see, uh, native trees on farms as stepping stones uh, of diversity throughout a landscape. At the moment, we've got a very, I mean, you think about an agricultural landscape, it's, it's sort of built in blocks. There are blocks of trees and then there's grass and it's either flat or it's three dimensional. Really, ideally, we want all those, uh, the potential for all those um, uh, habitats to be represented, a little bit of new growth across the, um, across the landscape. And uh, and they're very diverse. They're spread they're spread apart. So these are where you where you can increase the um, the, the tree uh, silver cultural habitat across farms. You increase the connectivity across the landscape. And so, as one farmer put it really well, he said, "I want to be on my farm. I don't want to be fifty meters away from any natural habitat at any point on the farm if I can help it." I thought it was a really good way of putting it. We chosen as a species mix. Something which will suit most sites. Most uh, North Devon's quite interesting. It's um, 
there's some there's some quite fertile patches on the whole um, it's not very free draining throughout so these species kind of reflect that oak is a species that will thrive pretty well on um, on any type of soil but particularly these heavy clays that we have um, we might have included ash in that in in that mix if we were allowed to but you all know what's happening with ash at the moment in ash dieback um, and actually, to be honest with you, ash is a bit fussy sometimes. If you stick ash on a heavy clay, it might grow quickly to begin with, but it often gets a little bit cankered and weakened um, in the later years. Willow obviously will thrive very well and birch too. Field maple may be a little bit fussy, but um, I think it's, I'm right in saying it's a pretty good fodder one, so we kept that one in. Um, alder for the very wet sites, obviously. Scotch pine for um, not native, as such, but uh, I suppose near native, it's probably been through the southwest once. You know, it doesn't occur naturally here at the moment, but it's an incredibly useful tree from our point of view in this perspective, as it has these antiseptic qualities and also uh, to an extent in its younger years, year round, um, year round wind resistance. So useful for shelter there. Hazel, a very important mix um, in any native um, in any native woodland, as is hawthorn. You might be surprised to see elm there. Some of you may say, well, it's not going to live. Well, actually, it, it will live. It, it just won't get to any size. It gets to a certain size, the, uh, the beetle will tend to attack it, and that kills the tree. But if you can keep it less than that, which um, cutting for fodder, etc., will be... Uh, uh, will do or browsing low keeping it browse low then um, it doesn't reach that size and you you'll have probably seen um you don't it doesn't reach the size where it's susceptible and you'd have probably seen plenty of elm suckering in hedges anyway so you, you get what i mean elder again a good native and uh potential for uh, uh an insecticidal quality holly uh any of you have been in woodland and seen what deer can do to holly um it is very very browsable and spindle is just nice and colourful. We're not quite sure where we put that one in, but uh, it, uh, <laughs> it's definitely good for the butterflies and bees. Um, so just moving on to site suitability and habitat considerations, really, this is just looking, taking an overview of Hens Farm and the three areas which we chose to demonstrate with three different uh, models. Um, quite a big field up here, actually quite flat and free draining and i don't know if you can see that I've, i should be circling that with an arrow i don't know if you can see you can see that. that's good so uh, an opportunity for mob grazing in there this is a rough site down here quite wet quite natural and uh, uh you'll see why we chose our model in that one and a third site down here which is pretty regular and actually contiguous with a piece of uh, with a piece of planting here so I'm going to pass back to Luke as we move into the first model, which is that top field I showed you where uh, we decided to go for this type of planting. Right, so um, the field's just over 10 acres and it's, it's an arable rotation. Um, and it's just coming back into grass after being in oats for the last year. And what Hen wants to do is, um, is to divide it up so that she can graze it in a more managed fashion, whilst also keeping it open for, for putting back to arable in the future. Um, and the field is exposed to westerly winds that come up through here, and the livestock find themselves sheltering against the west hedge. Um, so her idea was to introduce paddocks, about one hectare each, and to have a area of a belt of trees about 20, 25 meters wide um, and once the trees are established to lift the fence on one side and allow the animals access into the into the area um, so we've used this design which is because of reasons of the trial we've asked that all shelter belts make up 20 percent of the area of which they're planted so that means that at 200 trees per hectare, the trees are being planted quite densely um, at about three meter spacing, which as you can see in mixed knife or illustration on the right, you have the oaks down the center and a minor broadleaf species to the sides. And then you have clumps of shrubs running along the edge. And the idea of that is that the standard trees, 
firstly, it, it mimics um, natural succession to an extent. Um, so your standard trees will be in the center and the minor broadleaves will grow up to the side and shrubs along the, along the edge. So it's a natural habitat, but it also means that the shrubs are available for browse um, and the oaks will offer shelter in the middle. So the idea is, is that the animals will move through it and use the whole area. Um, it's fenced with stock netting, which has made it very expensive, but because of the long-term nature of the, of the establishment and the long-term nature of the new parcels, the fact that she wants that field to be four parcels running into the future, that seemed to be a sensible approach. But it definitely pushes the price up to an area where you would wonder if it was cost effective if this was outside of a trial. Um, so at this point, we want to wonder if there's any questions from anybody about the specific design. So thinking of that field um, and how we've approached it, whether you've got any questions of how else it could have been done. Luke, there is a question from Niels about how will weeds be controlled during establishment? So it's a good question that is, is hard to answer because it's different for each farm. But in this one, the shelter belts will be fenced off and there'll be no browsing through the entirety of establishment. And we're imagining that at the relatively dense planting design for it, that the sward underneath will cease to be productive and that the belts will serve other purposes. There'll be browse available and there'll be shelter available, but the majority of the grazing will happen outside of the belt. Now that's different in the other planting designs where the grazing and the planting are, are in one and the same area. And in those places, we're looking at different means or different approaches to grazing the area through the establishment period and short bursts with sheep. Um, and also in some of the more kind of regimented designs, there is scope for cutting in between the alleys, in between the roads. Um, but it does change very much depending on what you're trying to do. So hopefully as we go on, you'll get a better idea of how that can be done in different scenarios. Um, Luke, there's a question from Silas, which is um, why is oak so desirable within this particular scheme with the problems associated with acorn poisoning? So Lindsay can talk a bit about acorn poisoning because that does come up and Nick is better place to talk about why we've chosen oak. Over. Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose this is something that we have to consider with all trees, you know, the, the, the quantity uh, and what parts that animals can eat. Now, some eating of acorns is not poisonous and we have, we have older farmers taking their animals out, cattle out deliberately to eat acorns. So, so it's the quantity that has to be managed. We also know that cattle in the new forest and horses in the new forest are also eating some acorns, but at the same time, if the pigs aren't let into the forest and the, un and the cattle are overeating, then you also get deaths. So it, it's about managing um, access. Lindsay, just, sorry. No, carry on. I was going to say, whilst you're, whilst you're on this point, actually, there was a question earlier, I think, from Joanna, who was asking about um, other trees being poisonous. So it might be worth just touching on things like you or other examples as well. And maybe mentioning ivy, which just in relation to, you know, animals eating other plants. Yeah, well, I, I, I added a comment about ivy. I mean, it's one of the plants that we don't know enough about yet. We do know that it's attractive. Um, and I've been reading up about old anecdotal conversations about ivy. So if you've got a sick animal, um, you offer them ivy. And if they don't eat that, they won't eat anything. So it, it's um, considered a, a pick-me-up or at least a measure of whether the animal will survive or not. But there are also cases of, cases of ivy poisoning. And so we need to know much more about this. Um, I mean, there is also a, a philosophical issue here, if you like. Are we looking to eradicate all poisonous plants from our landscape or are we learn, are we meaning to understand them and manage them better? Um, for example, you, you know, if you talk to 
um, Bill Grayson, who has managed uh, conservation grazing, he has seen um, groups of cattle happily browsing on you with no um, observable ill effects. We know that deer will browse to a certain extent on you, but we believe that it's to access the uh, tannins and other poisons, if you like, but, but regulating it so that it's managing their disease or their parasite levels. Um, and really the key here is to understand that with diverse landscapes also comes learning. So if the animals can learn what is in their landscapes and what they should be eating, um, they can also help to manage it. And, and I can see Daniel's comment that he had a cow die with you poisoning last year. Of course, it absolutely is a concern, but we do know, for example, I mentioned um, wild cherry and the increasing in cyanide in um, wilted cherry. Um, animals do die from browsing on wilted cherry, but at the same time, if they are if they have learned to live in a landscape with cherry, which regularly drops and wilts, we know that they learn to browse a little bit and then go away and then return and browse. They are actively, they take on more than would kill them, but over a longer period of time. So they, they do eat it, but they don't die from it. So they're learning how to manage those things in their landscape. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, Mick, were you going to come in about the oaks in this instance? Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I mean, from an oak from a, a habitat point of view is invaluable, as are some of the, the other choices that um, we put in here. We know that in this particular part of the world, we would expect to see more oak than anything else in the landscape. Um, and that's a reflection, really, of the time that it's been in the landscape. So... Um, there, there's almost a direct correlation between the length of time that a particular tree or plant has been um, has colonized an area and it's associated um, uh, invertebrate fauna. So uh, particularly with oak, it has something like two or 300 species associated with it. And hazel has a similar amount. And those two have been in the, the um, uh, part of the flora for an awful long time. And I think, just picking up on... Um, from what Lindsay's saying there, I think there is a certain, I mean, it's not all going to seed at one time. You can get years where oak hardly seeds at all, and you get mast years where the ground will be absolutely littered with, with uh, acorns. And I think the, 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 it's not too difficult to sort of associate when those times are and take appropriate action if that's the case. So um, perhaps there is a certain amount of us learning as well how to, you know, if we're going to live in a more diverse landscape how to how to kind of manage that how to manage our farming activity amongst that in a responsible way that avoids those uh, problems and and then just uh, probably bring these two questions together um a question from daniel about is it necessary to go north south with rose um, and tying into that from jason is it possible to make the shelter belts less regimented and more irregular or natural looking or does that affect their effectiveness um, and I think actually um, we've had Gemma and um, Barney have just come in to say, is anyone planting contours as opposed to straight lines, adding a gully and including hugel culture? So they're, they're looking for uh, quite a complex <laughs> approach there. Yeah, can I answer that? Uh, that's uh, yes, of course you can. I mean, as long as you, <laughs> I felt that when I was putting these schematics together, actually, they are very much schematics. It's, it's a rough guide and uh, please, you know, Think about bending the rules as much as you like. It's um, um, it doesn't, from a naturalness point of view, it doesn't look very. It doesn't look very natural in terms of you know um, it, its biodiversity. I don't think the biodiversity particularly cares, but it doesn't look very sightly in the landscape. I admit. So ring the changes by all means. Um, it's worth saying in this in this particular instance by planting the belts in in a, at a different angle. Um, or a different orientation to the prevailing wind, you wouldn't necessarily have a negative effect. You would just lose the beneficial effect or lessen the beneficial effect of the shelter. Um, but in alleys, alley planting, it can tunnel the wind and increase the speed by 15%, um, even more in some cases, which can be a major problem. And it does come up. There are farms, I'm working with a farm at the moment who wants to plant along contours 
for a number of reasons, and it, it makes sense from many of the many of the things we traditionally heard about or talked about in terms of food planting, such as prevention of soil erosion and reduced reduction of runoff, and those kind of points. Planting long contours is a logical thing to do, and so you've got a trade-off, and in cases where you want to plant long contours and you know it will tunnel the winds and cause problems in that way and you also are concerned about loss of light access to the ground and so subsequent loss of productivity then there might be alternative measures you can take you could plant more open canopy trees that would let through more light you could plant north south belts every hundred meters or so that will help break up the wind and stop it tunneling and so you you play it by ear. Okay, so just moving on, um, we've got uh, this field, which we decided to go for a very different take. Um, this was very much more along the lines of biodiversity. One thing I perhaps I should have mentioned that other design, one of the, the, the nicknames we gave it was, was green barns. And it's, uh, you can see how that fits with the, with, with the management needs. So the, the intention there is that those, those um, those fences come down when the trees are established. This isn't the last one. And the animals are free to go inside there. We don't expect there to be much grass productivity amongst that. Um, and also the animals need to be free to move around inside them. So if you ring the changes and leave gaps and keep it, you know, it, it performs its, its function just as well. This, this um, design here really uh, capitalizes on, on, on the idea of gappiness and, and the freedom of animals to move around. This is one of my, I, I particularly um, like this design. It's very similar to what you would get if you just allow, allowed a field to succeed naturally. You'd find there would be little areas which were, uh, which would scrub up quite quickly. Um, the sh thorny shrub species would appear and in the middle of that, you'd, you'd find the taller trees um, would begin to emerge and eventually you'd get something akin to the you know, clumps akin to the diagram on the bottom right there that you can see. And it clearly here, it's about, um, it's, it's about incorporating all the aspects, the shade, the browse, the, um, uh, the shelter um, across, across the whole unit. And from a habitat point of view, obviously it is, it is exceptional. So looking at the plus sides of this, um, you have this sort of extreme um, uh, habitat benefits. Some of the disadvantages, again, is that this is, and we're going to move on to this definitely, is protection. It's pretty impossible to establish something like this with the presence of uh, livestock. So in the previous example, you've got at least 80% of the field which continue to be grazed. This, it's going to be slightly harder because you've got to establish those trees um, with without any without any browsing it down to, to to nothing at all and you've got to protect it against deer as well so it's um it, this is a tricky one you can put deer shelters on uh, and you'd have to but they won't prevent sheep and cattle from knocking them over so in effect you're you're losing the um the potential for for introducing the the the, brow, the grazing stock but the way around this we feel is to introduce it gradually over the years allow them in, get your get the, the, the grazing started, watch out for what happens to the trees. This is what we're going to be doing with this one anyway. Watch out for what happens to the trees. As soon as things started getting, start getting knocked over or really heavily browse, or the animals learn, typically the animals learn how to knock over the shelters and push the trees down and, and browse them. You're going to have to take them out. Following year, you'll be able to do that a bit more, probably longer period. Gradually, when you reach about years three, four, five, there'll be, there'll be, able to go in for much, much longer. Um, but yeah, it is a downside of this one. Um, so um, are there any specific questions on that particular design? Mick, there was a question previously, um, which was asking about um, enabling um, rather than planting, but supporting regeneration work, which I suppose would probably be more appropriate in this sort of approach. Um, there is also yeah. a question, sorry, I'll just, just another question, which is about practical advice regarding tree planting, which might be useful to touch on here. Okay, well, I'll take the first one. Um, yes, with a, with a fence, particularly with a deer fence, which um, 
you know, if you take into account the amount of plastic you'd have to use to establish these trees, it's costly business. If you go at a certain scale, you could possibly do the same, same costs with a deer fence and just leave it to natural regeneration. I would suggest scarifying the ground to create a good seed bed. Grass is a, is a hell of a competitor. So you could, um, uh, you could certainly um, uh, rip up the ground a little to encourage some regeneration of scrub and shrub species in there. But yes, it's a, it's a perfectly viable alternative, just might take a little, uh, little longer to establish. With what we're doing with trees, really planting trees, is just giving it a head start. Uh, what was the other question specifically? It was about um, just any tips on planting, on tree planting. Um, it's about grass competition, I think I would say, uh, but it doesn't need to be. We tend to scarify the, the ground a little bit with our spades when we put the trees in. We don't, uh, in situations like this, we probably wouldn't need to a machine plant or anything like that because the densities are quite low it's perfectly possible to put you know 200 trees a hectare in um in a day with a couple of you um we will move on to the protection which is an important part of this towards the end of this so if if that's um if you don't need me to be more specific than that that's we'll move on yeah yeah that's great Uh, the last field. This um, one. Is that yours, Luke? Uh, yeah, I'll talk about this one. Um, so this this is the kind of standard image of agroforestry in a lot of cases, or rows of trees um, with space in between. And in Hen's case, it's the space in between is relatively low. It's it's regularly spaced across the entire field, so it's seven point two meters between every tree. Um, but in other farms on the trial, in fact, in all other farms on the trial who are using this, they've planted the trees in, in rows either side of alleys. The alleys have been set at a width that is compatible with whatever management they're looking to do. So some of the farms there, they looking to mob graze in between the rows through the establishment period. So you'd have a long, thin alley that might make up 0.4 hectares an acre or even less, um, and that they would be grazed and the animals would be moved every day, even every half day in some cases. Um, and then in other cases, the alleys are set at 12 metres, which will allow for the cultivation of arable crops in the future. And someone else is doing 24 metres, which you can set room to spray down. So it's all, it's all according to what your particular desires are for the farm. Um, and the general idea is, if you have any doubt of what you'll be using the fields for in the future, build your alleys wider um, to allow for more flexibility and management. Um, so hens only put in this 0.8 hectares, so two acres of this, and it connects a bit of recently planted proper woodland um, with, uh, with the edge of her farm, um, which then runs down to a group of other quite interesting natural habitats. Um, so a big part of the reason she did it was to allow for some open grazed wood pasture. Um, but it presents the problem of, of how it can be, how it can be managed through the establishment period. Um, so it's not, it's probably not the best example of this particular design, I don't think because she has to, the way she's doing it, she's separating off the whole field for five years or however long it takes and doing short bursts of grazing with sheep through that period to keep this ward under control. So similar to what Mick has described for the other one. Um, where we've got it in other situations, farmers are electric fencing either side of the rows. Um, and this has been tried in a few cases and there's some risk attached to it. So we're experimenting with different ways that that can be done and what level of voltage will need to be used. Um, but um, we're all slightly nervous about it. I've just seen Catherine Owen saying that the Darcington estate are trying with cactus guards, which has suddenly appeared in the last, I don't know, we've only seen them for the last few months, or I have anyway, um, but which seem really promising and we'll cover them in a bit more detail later. Um, what we're doing is a kind of cheaper and more natural version of a cactus guard, which you can see in that illustration on the right. So we're planting three thorns around each standard. Um, 
the idea being that that will act as an element of protection and it's mostly about rubbing as with the cactus guards so for anyone who hasn't come across them a cactus guard is effectively netting which has been manipulated with pliers to so that parts of the netting stick outwards and would spike any animal who used it for rubbing. The idea being it's spiky enough so it's not an attraction, which is a thin line. Um, the thorns will do exactly the same thing, but it's highly possible that three isn't enough and we would have needed to put six in. So we'll see that. And we we're actually doing a trial as part of this trial, a kind of miniature trial within a trial. Um, on one of the farms where he's putting cactus guards around some of his trees and then different levels of thorns around other trees. So hopefully we'll come out with some data of the best way to approach that. Um, um, Luke, sorry, just to jump in, just to say that we do have Tim Nicholson on the call um, who is responsible for getting cactus guards in this country. So it may okay. be that if folk have questions, they can, um, yeah, ping those out and we can maybe support with getting answers about those after after the session this evening. That would be great. Um, so the other thing to say about this one is that we've we've chosen 200 trees per hectare. Um, and the idea being that we want to find the level, the maximum level that is compatible with a productive sward. So we'll be doing we'll be monitoring the sward composition and sward productivity throughout the trial. And we expect to see some compositional changes at some point down the road of the tree establishment and the productivity changes to follow. Um, when exactly that happens, we don't really know. There's been a couple of relevant trials in the UK. There's a lot of data on this from abroad, um, which is pretty irrelevant because the main limiting factor for sward growth in the UK is solar radiation, whereas in other countries, it's other things, it's burnt off, lack of water. Um, so we need data that's relevant here. And from what we understand at the moment, where it's been studied 100 trees per hectare results in little or no losses to sward productivity and limited compositional changes. But 400 trees per hectare, which is the other, uh, the other level that has been studied, effectively acts as woodland. So the, the sward reacts as it does in a much more closed canopy woodland. Um, so we've chosen 200 per hectare as the kind of in, intermediate ground and through the trial it, it will be thinned out and so hopefully by the end of it we'll get a better idea of how far you can push it. Um, but that's a way off. Luke got a couple of questions, can, we, can I jump in with those, is that okay? Yeah absolutely. Um, brilliant. So there was a question um, about that came earlier, actually, um, about statutory authorities viewing the tree belts as permanent. Um, so interested to hear comment about reverting the field back to arable. And um, that was from John Tucker. I can't answer this. I mean, the problem with. We can talk about how they will view it in the short term and how it's relevant, how the, your BPS um in the short term but as the trees establish the policy context is changing so rapidly that it's very hard to say um, what is worth saying is that at the moment that image that you can see in the top left with the tree with the sheep in that field would would obviously be uh, eligible for bps payment if you took the sheep out of that image it would still be eligible as long as the sheep went in there for a section of the year. Um, that could be a day or two. What, that what the RPA wants to see is that the sward is grazable um, and they say that they need to see that sheep have access or livestock have access but how long that access needs to be for through the year is unclarified. Um, as the trees grow up that begins to change but we, sh we think that with a little bit of tweaking there should all, you should always be able to keep the land registered as agricultural under agricultural activity. Um, and that by the time the physical appearance, the land changes very dramatically, five, six years down the line or more, BPS will be a thing of the past and the context will have changed. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I think a re- that's a really good point that things are changing very much from a policy point of view and that, you know, we will see that um, reflected in um, in how BPS is allocate, well, how B- whatever payment systems are going to be there in the future and how they're allocated and what's taken into account, you know, all of that development is happening. But obviously worth remembering that in Scotland, we're in a quite a different situation. Um, and so, um, it, you know, that we don't have ELM here in, in terms of environmental land management, sorry, not the tree. Um, uh, we do have ELM here. Um, but uh, yeah, so just to bear in mind that it might be slower to change uh, north of the border, possibly. Um, we've only got sort of nine minutes left. Um, we were due to finish just at seven o'clock. So one other question, um, which I thought was interesting, was from Glenn, which is, is the option in the cluster planting to deer fence the boundary and then use portable electric fencing as you graze through to protect the trees and shrubs? Personally, I would say yes, because that's what we've been doing. But I'm really interested in hearing what um, what Luke and um, and Mick might say on that. Make do you want to answer that? Uh, okay. You're muted. Sorry, I'd have to hear the question again. I wasn't quite sure of um, what you meant. Um, I think the question was relating to when you're when you're doing your cluster planting. Do you deer fence the boundary um, to keep deer out, and then use portable electric fencing within the field, if you like, to protect the trees and shrubs so that you can graze around and between them? So you could you could electric fence sections. Is that the idea? Yeah. So I guess you could kind of almost mob graze through um, through that and protect keep keep livestock away from fairly newly planted trees yeah. by using electric fence. No, that would be that would be really interesting. That would be uh, you could set it off. You could start it off, and then you could you could leave yourself a little bit of time to concentrate on the on the best areas of regeneration. If you did that, electric fencing is a fantastic tool. Yeah. But I like I, I really do like the idea of, of seeing what develops and then and, and then choosing to fence off what you need. I'm, I'm hoping we're going to get some quite useful data that might not be scalable or even transferable, but on how sheep interact with shrubs um, through the establishment period and how the, sh- how the shrubs respond to minimal grazing, because there could be more scope than we realize for, for short term grazing with sheep. Um, and it, a lot of it depends on what's in their diet already and what they're missing. You know, if you put a sheep into a field um, and the sheep hasn't had any leaf browse through or enough fiber through its life or is missing various minerals, then it will run to the hedges and spend the rest of the day. And that will be the same if you put it into one of these areas. But if you have a more diverse grazing environment for the animals, then it could be that it will, and they will impact the establishing trees less there's, there's a huge amount of questions around this, and what we need to do is develop a, maybe Pasture for Life could do it on the forum, is develop an ongoing conversation around this and people's experiences so that we can collate that data and share it. Can I just rewind a little to John's question earlier? Um, just sort of got to, forgotten, I think, about, did you mean actually reverting to, uh, to arable, or did you mean using it as... Uh, rotationally as a silver arable, silver pastoral system? No, I I, I meant just issues about um, reverting it completely to arable. So, you know, I've had issues with Forestry Commission trying to get um, cricket bat willow removed, for example, and then having to, part of the agreement is you have to replant somewhere else. So so I just wondered, you know, how, how permanent these might be viewed as by the likes of the Forestry Commission and how difficult it might be to get felling license to completely remove them and put that field back to an arable system. Mm. It was a very theoretical question, I'm afraid. I, that's like, I think in the context of this trial, John, it was meant to be, we were talking about, um, I, th- I think that's the way Luke phrased it, it did sound like a bit com- like complete removal, but I'm pretty sure that Hen was actually thinking of a rotational silver arable then silver pastoral system and um, I think when it comes to when it comes to complete removal it just falls under the forestry act so we're talking about um, all trees become licensable at uh, certain uh, it's a difficult to say certain sizes and volumes and numbers um, in theory you're allowed to fell uh, five cubic meters um, 
per annum. If it turned out to be a complete disaster and you really didn't want to continue with it, I expect if you were thinking ahead, you could remove, legally remove uh, trees before they became too problematic. But I think it's worth bearing in mind that um, the, the, the ideal solution is, again, to remember that these, it's very easy to think of these as permanent structures. Once you put them in, they're complete and they're going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger and you're going to get a stand of, a thick stand of trees. Thinning and silvicultural techniques, coppicing, you know, a combination of all those techniques will, um, will keep um, your grass as, you know, being productive. And also thinking about trees and shrubs getting a little bit too high and losing all those shelter um uh that 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 uh, um what's the word i'm looking for uh, the ability of trees to shelter coppicing is a fantastic tool it brings it right down to you you, you want multiple layers of, of, uh, of wind resistance if you can so the dynamism in the system is an equally important thing to remember we're worth making that point in relation to browse availability as well and the, the natural process of the shrubs is that they will grow above browse height eventually and the, the, the heavily or regularly browsed branches at the bottom will fall away and so there's going to need to be some continual management in this scenario basically coppicing i mean the, there's so many possibilities around this that could work you know, even flailing, if you plant shrubs densely enough within rows of trees, between the trees, they could be flailed like a hedgerow. And if done on rotation every two, three, four years, potentially remain browsable and bushy like that. Um, so it's all open to play with, really. For those of you who know what a cactus garden looks like, um, there's a the diagram in the centre at the bottom there. That That is the cactus garden. And... Um, we're very interested to see how those work out, specifically for when you're planting individual trees in regular patterns, because it's very expensive normally to, to, uh, to put a big old wooden tree cage around it. So these are an uh, exciting um, potential solution. Can I just add something there as well? Because, um, you know, these are, they might protect the tree, but let's not forget why the animals are interested in rubbing in the first place. <laughs> you know, it is to maintain body care. So um, perhaps if we look at the image in the top right hand corner of the slide uh, and putting in designated rubbing posts would also help them fulfill that need as, as well as protecting the tree. Um, and I also wanted to mention at this point, you know, we, we've talked about physical protection of the trees and yes some of that will always be required um, at least for wildlife but there are some exciting uh, opportunities to use technology in this field and virtual fences have been um, a, have been developed over time and a Norwegian group have created what they're calling no fence um, and they're saying that um, it works very well it the an animals actually learn better with an auditory cue. They learn better to respect and avoid um, areas that they're not allowed to go than they do with old fashioned electric fencing. And they only require one DAP to learn not to do it. Um, and their stress levels with hearing the auditory cue are much, much lower than when they get zapped by a physical fence. Um, and they're also saying that the sensitivity is so great that you can actually graze animals on um, meadow and isolate individual um, orchids and things like that. So, you know, there is there is real potential, depending on the cost, of course, there is real potential for, for using this in the future and reducing that time of um, keeping the fields out of production. We're at seven o'clock, so I'm just going to, uh, we need to finish up, but um, just a quick plug that there was a PFLA members only webinar on No Fence um, a couple of weeks ago, so that should be available for members to access um, via YouTube. If not, what we can do is when we uh, make this recording available, we can put a link to the No Fence one if folk are interested, because I think there's overlap. Um, it is seven, so we are going to finish, but I do want to know if you were going to plant a few trees in a field from Michelle, this is the, qu the question, which would you choose? So can you just give us your top three trees to put in a field with uh, 
with stock. Luke. I'm new. Um, so Willow, because it's got all of the browse benefits that Lindsay mentioned, and it's free. Um, Hawthorne, because everybody else is ripping it out and it has phenomenal habitat benefits and it might protect your willow. And oak, because this is Devon and you can't get enough of them. Um, and it's good shelter, good, relatively dappled shelter. Actually, I'll swap switch oak for birch. It's good dappled oh, shelter. You can't <laughs> switch. <laughs> Lindsay, top three trees. Oh. I hate being asked about this because, you know, diversity is key to everything. So I don't like questions that reduce it. Um, but if you twist my arm, I'm going to go with the traditional ones. Despite the problems, I'm going to say elm, holly, uh, and I'm not allowed ash, which is annoying. Um, so I would say... Lime. Oh, interesting. And Mick, <laughs> what's your top three? Yeah, well, it had to be from the habitat point of view. So, and I was completely with Luke before he changed his mind. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, that's great. Right. Thanks, everybody, so much. Thank you to everyone who came along this evening and for the great questions. It's been really, really interesting. A massive thank you to Lindsay um, and to Luke and Mick for your time and uh, in preparing for this and for um, giving us a really, really interesting um, last hour and a half. So thanks ever so much. Um, this has been recorded. We will make it available to folk. So um, hopefully if you are interested in, in revisiting some of the discussion that we've had, you'll be able to catch that on YouTube. All right, good evening and thanks everybody. Thanks, bye. Thanks everyone, bye. <laughs>